Hi, everybody, and welcome in to Game 6 Remasters. We go back through some of the great moments of the 2017 Nashville Predators run to the Stanley Cup final, and it culminated in that huge game against the Anaheim Ducks in Game 6 of the Western Conference final that sent them there. Willie Donick here with you, and we're joined by Predators General Manager David Poyle. So uh, it had to be a pretty big moment, and uh, Ryan Johansson scored a big goal I think, to sort of clinch it in game six. And you now know you're moving on to the third round, the, the, the conference final, for the first time. So, so do you recall your thoughts sitting there at, at Bridgestone Arena? That was a big stepping stone right there before you even get to the Western Conference final. No, for sure. I mean, uh, when the first two rounds, obviously, we've never done that before. But now we're going to the third, third, third round, and this is, this is a different matchup. This is uh, – the big bad Anaheim Ducks, the, the, the size, the physicality, it's always a war every time we've played them. It's, I mean, nobody, nobody likes uh, each other. We've had, uh, we, you know, we beat them once before. And, and again, we know this is going to be hard to a, win this, but it's going to be hard to come out of this un, unscathed for, for sure. This is going to be a battle. So it's not like playing Chicago. It's not like playing St. Louis. This is going to be a war. And so you take game five and wow. You're one game away from getting to the Stanley Cup final, and you've got that opportunity to do it at Bridgestone Arena. I remember my reaction getting off your plane. What was the reaction of you guys seeing the crowd and this whole buildup? What was going on? What The transformation of this city and the fan base, what were you thinking as players? I mean, it was, it was insane. It was – I had never been a part of anything like that um, – Hadn't been any on any deep playoff runs or championship teams in, in any of my years previous. So to see the response like that when we got home walking off the plane, it was um, it was pretty surreal. It was we were all I remember just kind of laughing and looking at around at each other like what what is going on? This doesn't seem like real life. And um, man, the city was just so amazing and the energy was incredible from I mean from start to finish. But especially when we we came back ready to punch our ticket to go to the finals. Austin, I look at this this game, and it had been such a, a tough series so far. You guys are blasted with injuries. Johansson's out. Fiala's out from the, from the St. Louis series. And you go into Anaheim, take care of business in game five, and now all of a sudden the narrative has changed, and you can come back to Bridgestone and close this thing out. So before we get into that game, <laughs> what, what was it like – for you personally going through that journey so far and where do you think the turning point really was in that season that that you guys started to have that belief of we got something special here yeah I think um I think you really used the word for it was that belief um you know if I remember correctly I think we were the last team in um that year into the playoffs or at least in the western conference um uh, but we, you know, we were hot down the stretch. Uh, we played really well um, leading up to the playoffs, and uh, getting over the hump um, in that Chicago series uh, was was crucial. Um, you know, for us, and the way we played that series, and just what it meant to what it meant to the organization, and to do it in four games. Um, you know, at, at that point, we uh, we had a lot of confidence, and we really felt good about ourselves, and um, that just continued kind of. Throughout the next series of St. Louis, St. Louis series was was another absolute, um, you know, it was a battle. That was a tough series. Um, six games against a, another Central Division opponent. It was it was tough, but we, uh, you know, we carried a lot of confidence from that, uh, that Chicago series. So you're going into a big game six. So what what is – What's the mindset? Same deal. You don't want to go back to the West Coast. You don't want to go back for a game seven. You want to finish things off at home and, and get to the Stanley Cup final. So what are you guys talking about? How do you stay in that moment and not let it get too big for you with an opportunity at hand? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was another uh, tough test. Obviously, going into Anaheim for, for game five, we just knew we needed to steal that one, give ourselves a chance at home. And, I mean, we were just full of energy, um, just full of confidence. There was just a vibe in the room that no matter what happened that night, no matter how the game played out, we were going to win. And, 
and it, it kind of ended up being that way. We kept coming back and sticking around and sticking around. And, um, that's pretty much how it unfolded. We just, uh, we never, we never, we never gave up, had some big performances and, um, a pretty big upset again. The, the team sort of trade blows in the first four games of the series. Uh, you guys win the first game. James Neal scores the big overtime goal. Anaheim gets game two. And then Anaheim wins in overtime in Nashville in game four, evens the series at two. We're on a plane back to Anaheim. And I know you remember this well. And all of a sudden, and unbeknownst to the fans at the time, but Ryan Johansson is going to be unavailable. Mike Fisher is going to be unavailable. Take me back to that time because that's a, that's a real pivotal time in that series knowing you're going to be pretty shorthanded with a couple of weapons missing. Absolutely. And so the first thing is we, we lost the game, which is, that was, that was hard. Now that's, that was a turning point. If, if, again, if you were ever going to now pick who was going to win the series, it's, it clearly shifted back to Anaheim. They, uh, those four games were, were battles, like we said, but they got the fourth game. We're either up three, one or two, two. And now we got to go back into their barn. Now it gets way more complicated where you have your top, Basically, your top two centers and Johansson and Fisher, they're unable to, to play. So what happened? <laughs> well, we, what we did is something that we've never done before, is that we, we kept that confidence. We kept that belief. The coaches did a remarkable job. The players that got moved up into the lineup did a remarkable job. And that win probably in Anaheim for, for game five, that maybe singly, that one game, probably meant as much to, to me or the franchise in terms of standing up and doing what you absolutely had to do to, to, uh, to win, a, win a series. And when we won that game, I thought, I don't care who's playing for us, we're going to win game six. So it's a, it's a, of course, these are long flights coming back. You're yo-yoing back from California to Nashville. But as you mentioned, uh, the belief is surging again with, uh, with the, the, no, the knowledge that you're one win away now even with this makeshift lineup. So going into game six, Anaheim also was starting to experience some injury difficulties. And, and the biggest thing was they had lost their goalie in, in John Gibson and Jonathan Bernier, a guy that had played a lot of games against you guys in the past, was, had, uh, had taken over. So give me the feeling as you kind of, you know, watch the atmosphere uh, develop outside of Bridgestone Arena going into game six. As you mentioned, you, 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 you had a pretty good belief that even though you guys were down a few bodies, that you had an opportunity here? Well, regardless of what I just uh, said about after winning that, that <laughs> game in Anaheim Game 5, I know the game had to be played. And uh, but I, I don't know, I felt, I felt good about the, the game. I just felt that, uh, that they really got hurt by that game. They never thought we were going to be able to compete with them, especially with the injuries that we had that was in – their home barn and as you said it's not easy you're traveling out to Anaheim back they're five hour flights back and forth and it starts to wear on you physically and, and mentally so I thought despite the injuries we had that we were in a good position that we we're going to play our our uh, our best game and and let's face it psychologically if we don't win that game it probably goes back to favor them for game game seven so this is our game seven right in our our own building our chance to win in front of our home fans so to me this was kind of a all or nothing type of a night. So you have a hard, tough loss. The series is where it is after four games. It's tied at two, and you're off to the hospital after the game. What was that like? Well, as long of a story it could be, I'll make the shorter version. I'm second period. I get the knee. Uh, Manson's knee hits me in my quad, and. And I'm like, oh, that's going to hurt in the morning. That's, I literally said that to myself. And I, like, went back to the bench, and I'm like, that's going to be a good turn reverse. Like, all right. But, I, like, I ain't going anywhere. Like, I'm playing this game. I'm like, I don't care. It's a Charlie horse. I'll be fine. And so the second period, there's only, like, five minutes left in the second period. And now I'm in the trainer's room in between the – periods and I'm like you gotta do something you gotta freeze so we're ripping my pants off freezing my leg and spraying all whatever they could find on it so I could try and skate so whatever I get out there in the third period and I feel like I'm 
skating around like a wounded duck. But it obviously wasn't that bad, but that's how I felt. And I'm just like powering through it, powering through it. And then the damn game goes to overtime, and I'm like, oh, I got I to gotta just give it my all until I can't play. Like, I'm going. And I, I told everyone this. I'm like, I was one shift away from – right before they scored, I was one shift away from looking at coach and being like, coach, I'm going to hurt our team. I can't skate anymore. I was that close to being like, I'm, I'm going to hurt this team. I'm going to lose us the game. Like, I cannot skate anymore. And I'm like, wow, this is bad. I've had some Charlie horses, but so I get off the ice and now I'm icing it back in the trainer's room and, and I'm icing it and icing it and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get on a flight to Anaheim tomorrow and go play the next game, but whatever, I'm doing it. And it I hurt go, that go, bad. It hurt that bad in that moment. It was hurting that bad. Oh yeah. Wow. I get. I'm like, yeah. I'm like walking basically on one leg to the shower after I'm done icing it and doing all this treatment, and I'm in the shower with the guys, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, man, this is bad. Like, this is a bad Charlie horse, and they're like, hey, your leg's pretty swollen. Blah blah. blah. And I get out, and I'm. <laughs> it's kind of funny now that I can look back at it, but I'm trying to get my underwear on. <laughs> like I can't lift my leg. Oh so my. the guys are like lifting my leg, putting my underwear on for me. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, you got to get the docs here. This isn't something's wrong. And the docs came running back. I'm like, I can't move my leg. I can't lift it. And all of a sudden it just started going my leg. And it was like, Whoa what is going on now i'm like what is going on my leg was like twice the size as it normally is and and it kind of freaked me out because our doctor he was he would they, they started holding me because i could barely stand now it happened so fast and they're like get the ambulance get the ambulance this is what is going on here? like my i got a charlie horse like what why do i need an ambulance they're like, and now they're talking, it could be compartment syndrome. I'm like, what the heck is compartment syndrome? Like, what is that? And all of a sudden, I'm laying down on the, the thing, and they're, they're, they're carrying me up the back stairs. There's like eight people carrying me up the back stairs to get me onto street level where the ambulance is. And these guys are grinding me up these stairs. And I'm like, we're going to fall, all fall down these stairs here. Like, what is going on? And then, boom, getting the ambulance, ripped me over, and, and, uh, and then just went right into surgery. It was, it was pretty bad, but it happened so fast, and it was just such a rare injury. I was, it was just weird. Mike Fisher at this point, with the series tied at two, has has gone down. Yeah, you know about Ryan Johansson. So Ryan Johansson has got this crazy injury after a game, gets rushed to the hospital. He's done. Um, Craig Smith had been banged up in and out most of the, uh, the whole time. Mm -hmm. So now what are you thinking? It's tied at two and you're getting now even more, you know, important pieces that, that are dropping like flies with you for you guys. What, what are you thinking at that point tied at two? Yeah. I mean, I remember coming to the plane, um, the game after night after game four, we're heading back another long flight back over to the West coast. And, um, I got on the plane and Joey wasn't on there and I was, I had no idea what had gone on the night previous and um, one of the boys filled me in and I was sh shocked, just in complete shock, worried. And then I, the next thought I was, uh, was pretty stressful. I was like, I'm, I think I'm the next guy up to fill either Joey or Fishy's spot in the top two, top six uh, playing center. So um, it was a bit of a, Oh my God moment when I was on the plane, but, you know, I settled down and uh, kind of accepted the challenge shortly after that. Yeah, I was on the plane with you, and when they shut the door, I thought the same thing. I'm like, you know, uh, some of the, the, the broadcasters were, like, looking at each other, and Chris Mason and Willie Donick and Pete Weber were all looking. Like, did anybody see Ryan Johansson? Did anybody see Mike Fisher? What what What's going on? Yeah, like you said, Ryan Johansson, none of us knew what had happened. When did you get informed? Like you said, you knew – if Ryan Johansson's not on that plane, you're, you're moving up. Uh, so we would find out that, that first line, but when did, when did you learn, when was the first conversation had with you of, you know, what they needed from you the rest of the way? I mean, it pretty much, we, we usually would have a meeting when we got into the city and um, 
obviously we, we touched on what had happened with fish and Joe and, um, I, I, I think we just posted the lineup and, um, that was pretty much it. There wasn't any big conversations. It wasn't, um, it wasn't anything special. It was just business as usual. It might sound weird, but, um, that's just how we rolled that ser that series. So another theme that's going on around you guys is, you know, who's singing the national anthem, what a listers coming out to sing the anthem, who's going to be, you know, the seventh man, who's going to have the rally towel, you know, and who's going to be on the band stage. And there was this whole other story. Like how yeah. much were you guys paying attention to that as well? Could, could you even pay attention? Oh, we, lo we love that. We love that. <laughs> I mean, every morning we weren't doing pregames K too often at that point in the playoffs. And I mean, the whole, all we would talk about is who's coming up for the anthem and who's <laughs> going to be there and show up to, to get the boys and the crowd fired up. It was, it, we were definitely involved. Were you guys, did you know? Or were you, if you didn't know, were you trying to guess who it was going to be? Did you guys yeah, know? It was mostly speculation. We, we were we were wrong more of the time than we were right. <laughs> but uh, usually someone had a, a pretty good guess. And um, I mean, there's so many stars that could come and sing in in Nashville. It was it was a tough guessing game. So Trisha Yearwood, just for historical purposes, was the anthem singer for for your game six. Eddie George was. Eddie George was out there on the ice with her, if you remember, on the red carpet. Yeah. And then on the band stage, do you remember who was <clears throat> trying to get the crowd going? I want to say Keith Urban, maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Two member, two teammates of yours. It was Ryan Johansson and Kevin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about I wasn't even thinking player-wise. <laughs> so did yeah, you know I, then that they were going to do that? I had no idea. That was, I think, uh, we were all surprised to see them up there. Yeah. What did it mean to you guys to see them up on stage? I mean, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, we were we were out there um, playing on the biggest stage that any of us had ever played on, and um, to see them out there supporting us and, and waving their towels, and you could see the emotion in their eyes. They're kind of welling up. And I know how much it hurts to to not be out there with your teammates. So um, a lot of motivation there. And so you just you just set the scene. Your teammates come to see you. You're saying go get them. And Colton Sissons has a hat trick. But let's let's not go there just yet. So I I tested him on you know who was going to be on the band stage. Who was you know the seventh man the anthem. I told him it was Trisha Yearwood. Eddie George was out there on the carpet with her. And you Ooh. and Kevin Fiala were up on the band stage with the rally towels. So, so tell me how that quick, all quick, about. quick background before the rally towels. So my original surgery, my leg was open for five, four or five days. It had to be open, flushing out all the swelling. So I have to do surgery that the morning of game six to close it all up now. Now they're going to staple my whole leg, close it up. So I get out of surgery and it's like three o'clock, four o'clock. And so I take, take an hour or two. And they're like, all right, we're going to, you know, we got to get you a ride home. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, take me to Bridgestone right now. And Doc, Doc, our Doc was like, all right, but as soon as that game's over, you need to get right home. And I was like, okay, deal. And so, like, I'm, I'm all drugged up still. I'm like a zombie, but I'm like, I ain't missing this game. I don't care. Like, my team has a chance to go to the Stanley Cup finals. Like, I'm being there. And so now I get there, and they're like, you want to do the rally towel? And I'm like, well, I mean, I could barely stand up, but sure. Like, all right, you know, maybe it'll just get the crowd fired up a little more. And I was so I was so messed up. I don't even remember really how loud the crowd was. All I remember is just seeing the whole arena full and, and being there with Kev, which, which was cool. But then I just – I got carted right down to the to the locker room and just – elevated the leg and was and watched the whole game down there well with six minutes to go you get the big play and and colton sissons who already has two goals in the game two very big goals of course scores the biggest one of his career he had scored a hat trick earlier in his career in tampa i don't know if you remember that one one of them was a, a tap in at the very very end and, and so he had done this before but you know when you start thinking of unlikely heroes 
he's not the guy you're thinking about that's going to score three goals. But he was the guy that was really elevated because, as we mentioned before, Johansson and Fisher are out. So he's getting big minutes. And, boy, what a huge play it was when he got that great pass from Cali Yarncro. Yeah, it's unbelievable what uh, in, in sports what happens or needs to happen for all of these stories for us to have this conversation today. I mean, Johansson out, Fisher out, Colton Sissons, who's playing basically a third-line checking position, uh, is elevated to first-line role to an offensive position. And what does he do? He gets a hat trick in the biggest game of the year. And as you say, his his biggest biggest effort uh, individually that he's that he's had in his his career. And that was that was a phenomenal goal. But I must be honest with you, the next goal <laughs> to me, I remembered equally as well. And there wasn't even a goalie in there. It was an empty net goal by Philip Forsberg. And uh, I think they, where I sit, I probably have it's about probably eight foot ceiling. I'm pretty sure I hit my head when I when that that puck went in the, the net when I when I jumped up because I knew we were one and we we're moving on to the Stanley Cup Finals. Twelve seconds remaining in the Anaheim power play. This game tied at three on the wall. Take it away, Yarncroak. Yarncroak out to center. Drops for assistance. Power play about over for the Ducks. Here now is Yarncroak across for assistance. He scores. Oh my goodness. The score. And the Predators take a 4-3 lead as they were killing off the remainder of a penalty. So I guess let's start with, I guess it was a turnover. Take us through the goal, the game-winning goal. Do you remember? Yeah, it was, um, we, well, I think we had just finished off a huge penalty kill, actually. Um, Callie and I were out there. Um, like, you kind of dropped it to me um, coming up through the neutral zone, and I drove it in wide, and... Uh, Actually, you know, I'm feeling good. I actually tried to pick Fowler, I think, one-on-one and uh, kind of knocked him down in the process. And the puck ended up back on Cali's stick, and I got lost on the backside. And he made a beautiful pass, um, basically, right in, right on the tee for me to, to get a good shot off and um, put it upstairs, and uh, the rest was history. And, and just building off the atmosphere, what do you remember when the team went up 4-3? And, and it, look, it was still tight. I mean, it wasn't – Anaheim wasn't going away. They're a scrappy team. You knew that they – you weren't out of it by any means. But what were some of the feelings that you got and what the atmosphere was when you guys went up 4-3? Well, it's funny. Watching a game with me, you know, normally my family's with me. A few times a year they don't come, give my tickets to someone else's organization or some type of yeah. social media or somebody. But I always tell people, if you're going to sit with me, you can't expect me to speak. I don't. And that's yeah. weird. You're hearing that like, wait a minute, you can't shut up. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, during the game, I, I just, I'm pretty, pretty intense on the game. And I like sitting around people I know because they expect a miserable experience sitting with me, no matter up 10 nothing or losing 10 nothing. Um, and so that game was really no different, except when it was 4 3, I remember the clock just stopped. It was as if, the game was not moving forward at all. I mean, shifts were going in and out. I, I realized time was moving, but every time I looked at the clock, it just seemed like it, it, I was in fifth grade again, looking at the clock and it was 155 still, and it wouldn't go to two o'clock so I'd get out of school. That's why I felt. And uh, it, it was pretty tense. And I remember afterwards, when I sat down finally, how tired my legs were, because you were so t- yeah. tense, right? And you're up on your, your feet and your tippy toes and leaning in. Um, that game was far, far, far from over. I mean, that, that is a good sure. team. They're an experienced team. You know, they have guys that have logged, you know, incredible number of playoff games versus the number that our guys did. Um, and I really thought that series would end up going seven games just with the way a lot of things played out. You know, you're down Ryan, down Kevin, you know, um, Fish was kind of in and out. So yeah. uh, you, you just assumed if we were going to win that, it was going to have to go seven. But when you went up, it was like, oh. And you don't want to think it, you know, you, you don't want to jinx yourself as silly as that may sound, but it was pretty intense. My wife has a thing where she does not look at our defensive zone when they're coming in. <laughs> I don't know why. So she's been really excited about all of our re-airs and listening to your re-airs of the games. She said, why? Well, I, I never knew what happened up past the blue line. Um, she just thought whenever she looked, they'd score. So she just stopped looking at that end. So I remember – like, you know, looking, and she always sits to my right, and look at this way, and then I come back, and I look over, and your shoe's not looking that way. She just stayed that yeah. way, so it was fun. 
there was is it was something the relief though when that you know final buzzer went off it really was a relief then ecstasy and joy it, it was pretty amazing what what did you think now there was still more more work to be done you're still six minutes to go it's a one goal game but at that point you're up four three in the third period what what are you thinking at that moment I, I mean, we, we, we were going crazy, obviously, and um, everyone was losing their minds. You couldn't, you couldn't think your eardrums were shaking. It was so loud in there. Um, but again, we had to regroup and, and settle in. We knew where the clock was, and um, we just we were full of belief that we were going to win that game, and just let's, let's shut them down. Let's just play the strongest defense we've ever played in our lives, commit to blocking shots, do whatever you have to do is keep this fuck out of our end as much as possible. And, um, we did that. Oh, yeah. And so, as you mentioned, Philip Forsberg scores an empty net goal. That puts you up by two. You have a very good feeling at that point. As you mentioned, you allowed yourself to celebrate some. Austin Watson then puts in another empty net goal, and now you know it's all academic. And it, it was interesting. Describe what was going on. You watched this, the game uh, at home in the same place with, with a lot of the same people. And there seemed to be a kind of a long ending. I think Anaheim mixed it up a couple of times. There mm -hmm. were some penalties called. And so there's this slow build up to the final horn. But you had a chance to really soak in that you're going to be the Western Conference champions. Yeah, I th you know, you kind of wish uh, that, uh, you know, you watch movies, how they show things going in slow motion. <laughs> like you kind of look back over, I don't know, we probably always have a lot of, lot of thoughts in our head about the, the season, our players, our coaches, our families. All the, all the stuff you, you went through to get to this point. I mean, it's just, you know, dreamy. Stanley Cup Finals, the Nashville Predators, finally. Wow. It's, it's, it's huge. So it's, uh, it still is. Like, talking about it today, it's, it's, you know, getting the goosebumps about it because it was such a cool thing for, for all of us, for me as an individual, for my family, for our team, for our own, for our city. I mean, it's, it's cute for the game of hockey. I mean, you know, yeah, that was followed like the year before was the all-star game in Nashville, which, you know, kind of set the, you know, Nashville up on an international scene. And it's, 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 it's made Nashville a place that players want to play. Yeah. Well, people want to live and come and play. It wasn't always the way when we started this franchise. So 17 playoffs, special time for sure. What was, yeah. what was it like for you being out on crutches out there during the trophy presentation? Ooh, it was, I was, that was crazy. It was it's almost emotional for me. I when I was I remember hugging all the guys and then coming down the bench and I remember just the carpet at the end of the bench. Just the carpet leading out to where they were gonna put the trophy. And nobody nobody said to me, Ryan, like come out for the picture. Come on but that's just where they were bringing the trophy out. And I was like, I don't care if I go down here. I don't care if this leg snaps in half again. I'm getting. I'm go. I'm heading to this carpet and I'm walking into this picture. And I remember taking my first two steps, and I look up and I see Coach, I see Lavi, I see Pex, and I think it was Yos and Fish, and they're all looking back, just just biggest smiles on their faces. And I remember grabbing my crutch and whacking Pex's pads that, and just just to be able to put my arm, arms around those boys and and knowing the work and the character those those guys have and, and everyone out there was I was really happy yeah you know, I could I could have still been in surgery that day or not been able to walk and to be able to be there for that moment and it was awesome wow well and I remember when we got in the locker room I mean it was Smitty gave me a bear hug like he's going around hugging everybody everybody's in in just a, a great mood. I interviewed uh, Matias Ekholm, who's, you know, got tears in his eyes because it, it, you could just tell that it was all setting in. So I know from my point of view, it was really cool to to witness all of that. And you brought up David Poyle uh, and him being a part of that. I, I know that that had to be a special point or a special moment just for you guys to see the, the architect of this whole thing from, from day one to, to be able to be rewarded to go to the cup final. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got, um, you know, a year or two later, the winningest GM in hockey and um, to, to be a part of and to, and to witness, um, you know, 
him have an accomplishment like that um, going to the finals with Nashville, the, you know, the team he had, you know, he, he's been here since day one um, and taking this, this team and this organization to a, to a place where we are now, um, you know, we're contenders. We're, we're a playoff team, you know, consistently year in, year out. And it wasn't always like that. Um, there was definitely right. um, years in, in the past when, when the team started that it was just about, um, you know, putting fans in the stands and getting a, you know, getting a winning hockey team on the ice. And, you know, just to, to be a part of that and to really, you know, for me and for, you know, individuals personally to, to be a part of um, something so significant like that, not just in our own careers, but um, for those around us and for, you know, the important people involved in the, in our team, it was, uh, it, it's pretty cool. How much did Peter Laviolette's experience of going to the cup final and going through these deep playoff runs with, with Philly and Carolina play into how he could coach you guys and you guys could lean on him because he'd seen it before. Yeah. It, experience like that is is so huge when you're going through um you know situations especially with a team that hadn't been there before but you know our boss had and and, and he knew you know you don't know what's going to happen but you, you can you can lean on different experiences that uh, that he had in the past and Lavi always did such a great job of, um, you know, moving from one day to the next, uh, you know, in the playoffs, it's so crucial not to, not to dwell on wins, losses, <clears throat> where you're at, um, you're on the road, you're at home, you're down in a series, you're up in a series. Um, Lavi was so good at not dwelling on things, but really keeping that day um, fresh in our minds and keeping us focused on uh, the task at hand that we had control over at that time. Of just what what that was like for you, just not only as the CEO, but for Sean, that you're with your guys, you're with the people that have all worked so hard to bring the organization to the moment, what, what it was like for you to be able to, to have that conversation and, and celebrate with those people. You know, Tom Segrin, who was our chairman at the time and uh, just driving force behind so many great things with the organization, he summed up really well that night. He said, it's hard, and you, you express it really well. It's, he said, it's just hard to express the emotion that I have right now. Because yeah. It's a mixture of pride, humility, excitement, joy, a little bit of, I knew it. Like, we knew what we were, and now the rest of you know. And, you know, it, 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 was, it was just it's a weird thing to describe. You got, I just know I get overwhelmingly emotional and I'm not a, a really emotional guy, um, except maybe you know, temper, but um, it, uh, it, it's just hard to describe. But I, I will say, and this is what's really, really bizarre. And I've heard other people say it before and I thought they were crazy. And this happened when I was in Tampa, when we beat Philadelphia game seven at home, we go on to the, the, the cup. That was a greater feeling than winning the cup. And I, yeah, I, it's hard to describe that. But you hear people say that all the time, but I thought they were crazy because what could be better, you know, than that? And there is something about, man, you're, you're going. And then anything can happen, right? It's, it's just it's that simple. Everyone's equal. And I felt the same exact way when we won. It was just such a great feeling for everything that you said before. I mean, here's a franchise that just nine years earlier or 10 years earlier almost left. A bunch of day one season ticket holders bought the team. People throughout the city rally around the team to keep it together. A brand new mayor who's barely sworn in and Carl Dean worked on it to make sure the team couldn't leave and, and could be prosperous, can move forward. The governor was there. I mean, it was just so many people were part of building that moment when we finally won to move on to the cup. Now, some people hear this and say, oh, that's why they lost. They're losers. They were more excited about getting there than the next level. And that's not it at all. Almost without exception, you hear people that have won the cup or the World Series or the NBA championship. That's the moment that you're going into the game. And then it kicks in that you just know you're going to win. I mean, you just, yeah. now we didn't, but that, that was the feeling. Unfortunately, the other team feels that way too. And then you got to play the games. But um, 
it really was from a fan standpoint, raw emotion. Like this is so great. And you're so happy for all the people that laid the bricks to get there. And then from, you know, uh, you know, my position position yeah it, it, it was this is absolutely incredible this is a payoff for all the things people did for us and it really started i said it started with the, the blackhawk series in 2015 i think that was our first real big step even though we you know lost that series second one was the uh 2016 all-star game where really yep. the rest of the world was like what is happening there you know it looks like a really really great party centered around the hockey team, and then obviously the next steps. Draw pulled back to the end board. They're going to let it run down without any more. And there we go, folks. Sit down if you need. The Nashville Predators are going to the Stanley Cup Final. They celebrate around Pecorine in the Nashville goal. Predators outshot tonight. 41-18 and win the game 6-3.